G'day, I'm Paul. So Lexus, they are doing such an interesting strategy at the moment. They're taking basically Toyota products, and they've always done this, but it has been ramped up big time. They're taking Toyota products and Lexifying them. And that's pretty much what is happening here with a new car called the Lexus LBX. This shares a platform with the vehicle that is the Toyota Yaris Cross, but this is the Lexus version. This here is also the cheapest Lexus you could buy in Australia at the moment. It starts at just under $50,000. This is the base model uh, sports version with front wheel drive and hybrid as well. This competes with things like the BMW X1, the Mercedes-Benz GLA, the Audi Q2. It's that sort of size of vehicle. So I'll be interested to see what this feels like because the Yaris Cross definitely feels like a cheaper Toyota product. Have they managed to sort of step this up? We'll find out. Today we're going to do a detailed review with this car. So if you do want to skip ahead to other parts of this review, you can use the time codes that are on the screen. Or if you're on YouTube, you can scroll down and use the chapters below. If you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel. Hey, are you thinking about buying one of these? If so, have you heard of Help Me Car Expert? All you need to do is go to Google, type in Help Me Car Expert, or scan the QR code on your screen. It will take you to the Car Expert website. It's not just me or Sean doing the video stuff. We're like a big company, 60 full-time employees, and on our website, you're gonna find news, reviews, and also our car chooser tool. If you're unsure which car you want, all you do is enter in all of your requirements. It'll spit out a stack of options. You can read the reviews, watch the videos, and then we can even put you in touch with one of our friendly dealers. Now let's talk about styling. Uh, I think the good news here is that it doesn't really look like a Yaris Cross. I guess the, the whole strategy of lexifying stuff, you can't just have it look the exact same or even just a slight variation. This looks totally different and I think that is a excellent start. They've also lexified the price of options such as paint. Uh, 1750 are the optional paint colours, which is obscenely expensive, especially when you consider optional paint colours on the Aris Cross are like 500 bucks, or if you go for a two-tone uh, setup, it's a little over $1,000, but I don't really understand why there's such a big difference there in terms of price on the same car. Uh, on the design front down here, standard Lexus stuff, big grill there, but I like the way they've integrated the grill colors. So you've got that sort of honeycomb section in the center, then it tapers out to this darker portion and then the body sort of wraps into it, which looks really cool. Brushed aluminum down the front here, full LED headlights with LED indicators, LED fog lights as well. Nice Lexus logo there too. Come around to the side here, we run a set of 18 inch alloy wheels on the base variant of the car here with some wheel arch cladding there as well. Machine finish on those wheels too, it looks uh, very nice. They're actually doing a sporty version of this car as well. It's basically going to be like a sporty version of uh, the GR Yaris, but here in Lexus trim in this sort of SUV shape. So I'm excited for that. You can click the QR code on the screen if you wanna see the news story that we did on that as well. Um, you've got black here on the wing mirrors with an indicator built into there, camera there for 360 camera. Black roof, which is what you get with the optional paint colors. You got this chrome strip over here. Love these door handles as well. So you got a little push button release there. So it's an electronic strike. That also means that when you're inside the car, if a vehicle, a cyclist, a pedestrian is approaching, you try and open the door, it can prevent the door from being opened. Um, if you do have emergency access requirements, there is also an emergency release here for the door. Same story on the inside of the car as well. Privacy glass, uh, you've got this black section here. This is typically a window on cars on the rear three quarter, but here it's sort of blacked out. So I'll be curious to see how that affects our blind spot. Come around to the back with me. I quite like this red color. It, uh, it sort of just works great here with the black section as well. Full LED lights at the back here with this little strip that runs along there. You've got Lexus lettering across here with LBX there as well. Uh, rear parking sensors there with a camera nestled under here as well. Now this car itself isn't actually that big. So, you know, if you are in the market for an SUV, but you don't want some gargantuan thing, it actually has very small proportions. So it'll be interesting to see what uh, cargo space is like and also rear leg room, because I did find that was an issue in the Yaris Cross. So let me know what you reckon in the comments section below. Cheapest Lexus on sale, under $50,000. Does that entice you over just the Toyota product? Let me know what you reckon. So we are inside the LBX. Let's start off with the key. You've got lock, unlock, boot, the Lexus logo down there, and a Lexus logo on the back. This is a proximity sensing key. So you can leave that in your pocket, grab the door handle on the way out. By the way, you know what this is? See this little set of numbers just here? There is a video that we've shot previously that explains what that is and 
why people can use it to steal your car. Not this one in particular, but cars in general. So click up there to watch that one. Um, yeah, just in terms of the interior design, if you compare this to the Aris Cross, this is a quantum leap forward in terms of materials and presentation. Um, with the Aris Cross, Toyota went sort of pretty low rent with it, scratchy surfaces, not really a whole bunch of upmarket stuff. Here with the Lexus, they've really gone that one step further in just making this feel like a Lexus. So that means soft touch surfaces all over the place. Even in the base model here, you've got these nice looking seats with the red stitching. Uh, they really have just thought about everything here to make this look and feel quite premium. So that is, um, that is good stuff. Now, what about your touch points? So soft there, soft on the door as well. How soft are they? We've got our durometer. We've tested the main surfaces in this cabin. If you do want to see how this car compares to others that we've tested before, have a look at the link in the description below. Now, what about build quality? Let's see what that is like. We'll give it a little shake in the center. That feels absolutely rock solid. Very good. And this is what our door slam sounds like. And it is worth noting, this is the button that I mentioned before. One push of that opens the door and then emergency release, you just pull it back and it will open the door. Now moving on to infotainment, this is the other big step forward over the Yaris Cross. You're getting an infotainment system that's just under 10 inches in size. Actually a good infotainment system as well. So this is pulled from other Lexus products. So easy to use, high resolution screen. You get voice recognition paired with that as well, along with smartphone mirroring that's wireless for both Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which I'll show you in just a second. But uh, inbuilt satellite navigation, you have the ability to load uh, connected services through here as well. Um, the screen itself is pretty easy to use. You have AM, FM and DAB digital radio. And that all goes through a six speaker uh, Panasonic branded sound system with uh, the ability to screen Miracast uh, and also play music from your connected device as well. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you have voice recognition for uh, giving the car commands and that can also then be forwarded through your smartphone mirroring appliances as well. So you can then ask it to do your phone to do things and it will uh, take care of uh, all of that for you. So this is what Apple CarPlay looks like. This is wireless, nice and quick, easy to use there. And this is what Android Auto looks like. So again, nice full screen integration, wireless as well, very easy to use. Uh, good integration here. Now, what about the screen ahead of the driver? So it's a 12.3 inch display. It is very sort of, uh, I guess, information packed. You can flick between screens here, but there isn't a great deal of customizability. You can sort of customize what appears uh, on the left and right and in the center there as well. But um, for the most part, it is just a pretty sort of straightforward setup. And uh, it's good to see there is no analog gauges here, even in the base model. Now, safety, you have autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian and cyclist detection. You've got an auto dimming rear vision mirror. You've got a blind spot monitor built into your wing mirror. You have front and rear parking sensors, a lane departure warning, a lane keeping assistant with radar cruise control, and then 360 camera. I will show you what that looks like. I'm gonna flick the car on, pop that into reverse. So there it is there. Um, yeah, look, the quality is not too bad. Uh, so you can see clearly what's written on our suitcase there and the 360 view kind of a bit redundant, but you can then go to just a rear view there that gives you a pretty sharp look at the back of the vehicle with adjustable lines as well. And let's switch this off. This is what the horn sounds like. Okay, so practicality and connectivity. What is it like? So uh, connectivity first, you've got two USB-C ports here. You have another USB-C port down here with a 12 volt outlet. So pretty well stocked there. You have a wireless phone charging pad here as well, plus a little slot in here to hold your phone as well. So they really have thought of everything here when it comes to uh, connectivity for your devices and storage for your devices as well, which is really good. Uh, bottle storage. So we'll start off with our coffee cup. It fits into there nicely. No risk of getting your nice little coffee delittered. Our bottle fits in there fine as well. But the interesting thing is you think, oh, what if I want another bottle holder? Well, you slide this little guy back and you've got a bottle holder just there that you can actually move as well if you need to. So that's quite a clever setup. Uh, you have bottle storage inside the door. I'll try the big bottle in there. Oh no, it doesn't fit. And then finally you have a glove box over here that is pretty compact as well. And this little storage slot down the bottom. And what about your comfort? So you have dual zone automatic climate control up the front here. You have heated seats. It's all driven through either these controls or the touchscreen 
as well. You've got electric seat adjustment for the driver, so you can go forwards and backwards. Your backrest can go forwards and backwards. You can raise the front of the seat, the back of the seat, lumbar adjustment as well, seat memory for the driver. Passenger is fully manually adjustable. And on the steering front, you have manual tilt and reach adjustment as well. Okay, so back seat. <laughs> this is, yeah, not great. Uh, so my seat is in my regular driver's position, but as you can see here, there is absolutely no knee room. Uh, toe room is okay. Uh, headroom is okay as well, but not amazing. So yeah, look, I think you're gonna be making a fair compromise here when it comes to leg room in the second row. And I guess that's what the, the NX uh, or the UX is for, but um, yeah, something worth keeping in mind. No air vents back here either, so it's gonna get pretty stuffy in here in summer. You do have two USB-C ports down the bottom here. Got ISO fix points on the outboard seats, no center armrest or anything like that. Um, if I ever think about who, would want to buy this car. Like I ever think about someone like my mum, right? She's going to be transporting uh, my my kids, uh, my nephew, uh, niece and all that sort of stuff around. They're going to have baby seat in the back. Uh, there really isn't a great deal of room here. You do have to step one size up if you realistically want to fit baby seats in the back here and, and use this to transport anyone that's older than, I guess, a child in the second row in comfort because it is a pretty cramped experience back here. What about our window test? Let's see how far down this goes. So it's auto up and down. Oh, so close. So what is cargo space like? It is a small SUV, so I'm not expecting miracles here. Um, all right, so we're talking about 400 litres of capacity here. Um, yeah, it's interesting. So you've got hooks off to the side, uh, a Lexus first aid kit. Uh, in here, have a look at this. So you've got warning triangle and tyre repair kit under here. You don't have a spare tyre. You don't have anything at all. So. Uh, you do get a little bit more boot space there, because if, if they did have a spare tyre, even a space saver, that would be significantly higher there. But um, I guess it is what it is. Uh, this is what it looks like with our bags in there. So laptop bag, and then suitcase. Doesn't fit that way, so you're going to go sideways with that. Uh, if you do want more space, though, you can drop the second row. Uh, that gives you, oh, by the way, 12 volt outlet over there as well. That gives you just under a thousand litres of space, but can you see the problem there? <laughs> you kind of have to climb Mount Everest if you actually want to put anything in there because you've got that giant uh, sort of step up there. So not exactly the most practical space, but you do have a little bit more to work with there if you drop the second row. Okay, we've just hit the road in the LBX. So what is it like in here? Uh, the last time I drove a Yaris Cross, I kind of complained that the interior was a little bit cheap and cheerful and a lot of road noise and all that sort of stuff. So um, we'll see what this is like once the speed picks up. But under the bonnet here, you have a one and a half litre, three cylinder petrol engine. So it's a bit of a, a strange little combination there, but that is also mated to an electric motor on the front axle. And that produces uh, 67 kilowatts of power and 120 Newton meters of torque just for the internal combustion engine. The electric motor comically produces more power and torque. It just does 70 kilowatts and a little under 200 Newton meters. Uh, but that combines to produce a peak output of 100 kilowatts. Now, I know I've thrown a whole bunch of numbers there at you, but the peak output is basically the point where you're producing the most amount of power from your internal combustion engine and the electric motor at one single point in time. So 100 kilowatts of power, not exactly a huge amount, but given this weighs like 1400 kilos, it is incredibly light. It means that um, you don't need all that much uh, power and torque to get it moving. What does it all feel like behind the wheels? So you're gonna notice here, as we're driving along, it actually dips in and out of being uh, in electric vehicle mode. And you'll also see down in this bottom corner as well, what state of charge the battery's in. So you can see there's about three quarters battery, it's just flicked over to EV mode, which means it is running now entirely on electric. The harder I press the throttle, the more likely it will be that the internal combustion engine kicks on. But it's all very nice and seamless and very smooth. There is also an EV mode button here, you press that and it will only run on electric. So, uh, but it only sort of does it up to a certain point. And then the second I put a bit more throttle in or the speed range is exceeded, it then kicks the internal combustion engine on. What about when you kick the throttle down? So if I give that a good nudge there, it then fires everything to life. This uses, um, it's a bit funny, it's called an ECVT. So a conventional uh, sort of 
uh, continuously variable transmission, which is what CVT stands for, uses a belt system and pulleys to sort of adjust your gear ratios as you go. This system doesn't have any belts or pulleys. It is a CVT by name only. It's just something that Toyota's concocted to make it easier to understand. But it effectively feels the same behind the wheels. When you get on the throttle, you hear the internal combustion engine making a lot of noise as, as it's uh, doing stuff. And this is actually the better way to do a hybrid system. Some other manufacturers run an electric motor in series with uh, a transmission. And the problem is with that, you feel all the step gear changes. And while the gears are changing, you're not getting any uh, sort of torque input from the electric motor. Whereas here with the, this CVT arrangement, as soon as you get on the throttle, you're getting that torque from the electric motor. And then when the internal combustion engine kicks on, you're getting that as well. So it's a really nice setup. Now let's talk fuel economy. So uh, Lexus claims a pretty incredible 3.8 litres per 100 k's. Uh, we're currently sitting on 4.9. I found typically with Toyota products, the hybrid stuff, that you can achieve the claim if you are sort of very conservatively driving, doing less highway driving as well. I find that when you start sort of getting up it a bit more, it tends to go a little bit higher because you haven't to work that internal combustion engine. But that figure itself, even at 4.9, is pretty incredible. I just thought I'd mention B mode as well. So what happens is when you flick it into B mode, it's actually able to use the internal combustion engine to act as a retarder. So what it does is when uh, you're in B mode and you roll out of the throttle, it's able to use excess energy that's plumbed through the internal combustion engine to charge the battery. Then when the battery is full, it's able to use the internal combustion engine uh, as an outlet for, uh, I, I guess, the, the momentum that you're generating. So it's a little bit confusing, but um, it's a really clever way to do things. And um, you know, I, I really like that they've come up with innovations like this to, to conserve that energy so it doesn't end up being wasted. Now, what about the ride? So in and around the city, it is actually quite nice and smooth. 18 inch hollow wheels, decent profile rubber. It sort of all adds up to being a smooth package. But what is it like when we hit our sine waves at 130? 130 is the maximum speed limit in Australia. And it's a speed we go across our sine waves here to see what body control's like. So there's 130 there. Yeah, it's, it's not too bad, so it feels fairly composed, but once you start hitting a couple of those consecutively, like you'll find in the country, it can get a little bit sloppy at the end there, but for the most part, it is actually not too bad. Okay, so bumpy road time. We do this at 90 k's an hour, and this gives us an indication of what this is like across a dodgy road like this with corrugations and uh, all sorts of nastiness actually really quite comfortable on this part. Here's our condensed sine wave where it gets quite bumpy. See, it is just floating over that. Um, yeah, so look, it is actually quite comfortable from behind the wheel here. I think they've done a, a really good job there with the ride and just, just getting it to cater for the conditions where this is gonna be driven, which is probably in and around the city. Now, as far as I can tell, aside from the eco mode, there are no drive modes here, so Go for a little uh, drive around our track. We test all of the cars back to back in the same way just to see what the actual chassis is like once you do get, get up it a little bit. There you go, tiny bit of body roll there, but uh, it's not too bad. I'm already sort of running out of battery here. So we're now relying entirely on that uh, small petrol engine and it really does feel quite asthmatic literally pinned to the board at the moment and it's uh, not really adding any speed on. Yeah, look, this is going to be uh, ultimately the issue you face with a lot of these hybrids that run small petrol engines. The batteries are never really that large, so when you exhaust the battery or it, it sort of uh, runs out of steam in terms of charging and discharging, and see that as well, the traction light flashing there. Uh, it does that when it's trying to go between regen mode and the uh, the friction brakes. It gets a little bit confused when the surface is uneven. I'll be interested to see what they do with the, the LBX sporty one that they're looking at because, yeah, I mean, the, the chassis feels good, but I just wonder whether it's up to having a super sporty application. So, um, yeah, look, I'm okay with it, just not really amazed as a, as a sportier drive. 
Now what about your road noise? So we've put it up against our calibrated sound meter. This is probably the bit that isn't very Lexus about the whole package. Uh, ultimately this platform is pretty noisy. It has to be catered towards a Yaris Cross, which is a cheap entry level vehicle. And they haven't done a great job in sound deadening. So you're getting a lot of wind noise and road noise as well from the tires, especially on coarse chip surfaces. So I think that could definitely be improved. Now on the visibility front, I can see clearly down the front of the car there, wing mirrors could be a little bit bigger. Visibility is okay, but the, the mirror itself is quite small. Visibility out the back is not too bad as well. It's not overly compromised. Then you've got all your parking sensors and cameras to make life easy and a blind spot monitor built into that wing mirror as well. Okay, let's test some of the driver assistance functions. I'm just going to switch on uh, cruise control at 70 k's an hour. That's the speed we normally test this stuff at and then we'll see what it's like in terms of being able to hold itself in its lane and to center itself. All right, so there's 70 k's an hour. Steering wheel is green now. So in this first lane here, it's doing a great job. We're basically dead center. We'll jump over to the next lane. It gets progressively harder the higher we go in terms of the amount of torque the vehicle has to apply to the steering to keep it within its lane. Excellent, so this second lane is pretty much dead center as well. Let's try the third one. Let's see what it feels like up here. Okay, the steering's gone green. Look at that, dead center too. That is a very, very impressive setup. So yeah, good job there, Lexus. Okay, let's do a little bit of performance testing. So there's a claim of 9.2 seconds for zero to 100. Now, there is no launch control or anything like that. I will switch traction control off though, and then we'll load up the throttle and go all the way through to 120 k's an hour. Let's see how we go. That's nice and zippy off the line. All right. Well, running out of room here and 120. <laughs> yeah, that really slowed down up the top there. I reckon that 80 to 120 time is going to be pretty slow. Let's see how that went. So, 0 to 100, 9.86 seconds. So, a little way off the claim there and not exactly super fast either. And 80 to 120, 8.45 seconds. So, majority of it's, uh, yeah. It almost takes as long to get from 0 to 100 as it does uh, 80 to 120, which is uh, quite interesting. So, yeah, once that, once that uh, battery runs out of puff there, you are left with just 60-odd you know, kilowatts of uh, engine power, which isn't a huge amount. So, um, yeah, I'd be interested to see what this is like with a carload full of people are trying to overtake and, and something like that. And now I stop from 100 k's an hour. Let's see what the brake and tyre package is like. Okay, here we are. Wow, a bit of a ghastly noise from inside the car there. Um, that, that is just one of the... I don't even know what that is, but it is part of the braking system. It's perfectly normal, but I hate when you hear sounds like that because to the average person, that may sound like something's wrong and they might let off the brake when in actual fact, there's no need to. So, uh, but anyway, uh, zero, uh, sorry, 100 to zero took uh, 2.84 seconds and 38.28 meters, which is not too bad. Um, if you do want to see how this car compares to others that we've tested before in terms of those figures, uh, have a look at the link in the description below. Now, how fast does it go in reverse? Here we go. Okay, so a fairly modest 32 kilometers an hour. Okay, so Lexus LBX, what do we reckon? Um, look, I'm sort of in two minds about this. I think the car itself is great. It's a huge step up from the Yaris Cross if you're looking for something a bit more premium. It wears a Lexus badge, it feels every part of Lexus outside of that sort of road noise that you get, but it is compromised. You don't really have a great deal of rear leg room and that may not be an issue. If you don't need to carry uh, taller passengers in the second row, that's not a problem at all because the boot's big enough and, and for getting in and around town, it's gonna to be great. It's incredibly efficient as well. It is only let down if you go for a sportier drive when it runs out of battery. It sort of, it just feels a little bit legless when it comes to that stuff. So let me know what you reckon. I think for the price you are getting a lot of value there, especially when you look at some of the competitors in this segment. Equally though, some of the competitors in this segment do feel much bigger as well. So keep that in mind. Let me know what you reckon in the comments section below. Have you bought one of these? 
What is it like? Did you go for the all-wheel drive or the two-wheel drive? The all-wheel drive is strangely slower than the two-wheel drive as well. So I don't know that I want to be going much slower than it is right now. So let me know what you reckon. If you did enjoy this video, please make sure you like it and you share it with your mates. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon. But until next time, take it easy.